Well, this evening we are finishing our series on salvation. As we talked about that order of salvation, as we think about what Christ has purchased for his people, we come to the culmination of the order of salvation. Something that you and I all look forward to. Something that even our dear brothers and sisters in the past who have passed away and many others look forward to as well. Namely that doctrine of glorification. As John Murray says, glorification is the final phase of the application of redemption. It is that which brings to completion the process which begins in effectual calling. Indeed, it is the completion of the whole process of redemption. For glorification means the attainment of the goal to which the elect of God were predestined in the eternal purpose of the Father, and it involves the consummation of the redemption secured and procured by the vicarious work of Christ. So we are resurrected like our Lord. We will resemble our Lord. We will have a body conformed to our Lord. And as we think about glorification, we're really talking about what's called personal eschatology. When we talk about uh, the new heavens and the new earth, when we talk about the different, different millennial positions, we're talking about what's called cosmic eschatology, how, what happens with everything. When we talk about glorification, we're talking about what happens to you and I. What happens to you and me when we come to our death or when our Lord returns. And even the London Baptist Confession Chapter 31 deals with personal eschatology, and chapter 32 deals with with cosmic eschatology. So in a lot of ways, we're going to look at chapter 31 of the Confession this evening. So perhaps as we asked often in this series, how are we saved? And even as we think about this idea of death, we are saved by being conformed to Christ's body in glory and experiencing the eternal life forevermore. So that's the focus this evening on the doctrine of glorification, how we will have a body like our Lord's and we will have everlasting life in the new heavens and the new earth. So as we think about this doctrine, we'll look at three points this evening. We'll look first of all at the intermediate state, namely what happens at death. Secondly, we will look at the resurrection from the dead, namely what happens at the resurrection. And then lastly, we will look at the eternal state, namely what happens for eternity. So the intermediate state, resurrection, and the eternal state. So let's first look then at the intermediate state, what happens at death. If you have a confession, you can turn to chapter 31. And if you see in chapter 31, our confession says, The bodies of men after death return to dust and see corruption. You see, when we talk about death, when we talk about the intermediate state, we're talking about the time between Christ's two comings, or perhaps the time before Christ's second coming. What happens to the body? What happens to the soul? And before Christ comes, the body and soul are separated until Christ returns, when body and soul will be reunited again. So what happens to the body? Well, it's very clear. Even in Genesis 3.19, after Adam has sinned, After sin has come into the world, we see the consequences of Adam's sin. God said to him in that covenant of works with him, he said to him that if you eat from the tree tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And then he says in Genesis 3.19 concerning the curse, he says uh, uh, for uh, uh, verse 19, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So we see corruption. We return to the earth. We return to dust of which we are. And even in Acts 13.36, uh, what they're speaking of there is David. They're describing David who saw corruption. And they're comparing David to David's greater son, Jesus Christ, who did not see corruption. So we see as we die, we return to the earth. We return to dust, and our bodies (coughs) do see corruption corruption. So that's man after death with respect to bodies, but what about our souls? You see, our souls are immortal. They didn't pre-exist, they were created, but nonetheless they are immortal. And our confession goes on to, to highlight things that it is not, but they're souls which neither die nor sleep. You see, there were some at the era of when our forefathers were writing that taught that the souls died. Now what that really meant was they carried the idea that the soul was put out or extinguished for a time and then it would be until the resurrection when the soul would be, I guess, resurrected until that time and when it's reunited to body and soul. So that was a false position. Another position was the reality that the soul sleeps until Christ returns. 
Now, I know today is the 500th day of the Reformation, and we're talking about Martin Luther, but Martin Luther did help to the idea of soul sleep. And there's a, there's a cause and effect in history with that. He was refuting the Reformed doctrine of purgatory. And we'll talk about purgatory in just a moment. But he did hold to that. Again, he's refuting that uh, purgatory. But nonetheless, he's wrong with respect to this idea of soul sleep. Because the proper view is the reality that the soul immediately returns to God. I think we see this in several places in Scripture. Perhaps we, we see this in Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So that's one instance that holds that the Spirit returns to God. Another is Acts seven fifty nine. This is the stoning of Stephen, the deacon Stephen, the one who's preaching concerning our Lord, and it says in Acts 7.59 that he returns, his, that he gives up his spirit. It says in Acts 7.59, And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So when, our, when we die, our souls return to our Lord. That is the proper view. The reality is until the resurrection, our body and soul will be separated. As the Westminster Larger Catechism 37 says, The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness, and do immediately pass into glory, and their bodies being still united in Christ, do rest in their graves until that resurrection. So body and soul are separated in in the intermediate state, and then reunited when Christ our Lord returns. So then, perhaps let's think further about this idea of souls. What happens to the souls of the righteous and what happens to the souls of the wicked. Not the Mm -hmm. bodies, but the souls. Mm -hmm. Souls of the righteous. They go, as we've talked about briefly already, they go and they are with their Lord. They are in heaven. That place of paradise. Now when we, strictly speaking, when we think about the doctrine of glorification, in reality it is, strictly speaking, talking about the resurrection. But there is in some sense that glorification begins at our death. Because we are made perfect in holiness. We pass into glory. And so that's what the confession says. Though the souls of the righteous being then made perfect in holiness are received into paradise. So we are made holy, perfect in holiness. We see that in Acts 12, 23 when the writer speaks of the new heavens, the new Jerusalem. And he speaks about the spirits of just men are made Perfect. And even in the context, he talks about holiness in several places in Hebrews 12. We are made perfect in holiness. We are also in paradise with our Lord, with our Christ. You see, we'll talk about this more as we go through. The blessedness of heaven, the blessedness of paradise, is that we are with our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we see in Luke 23, 43, with respect to the thief. What does Christ say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. Not your soul will sleep. Not your soul will die or be extinguished for a time. But you will be with me in paradise. And then Philippians 1.23, Paul speaking of to live is Christ, to die is gain in the context context of that. He says in Philippians 1.23, For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So we must, it's, uh, so we are with Christ in paradise. We are with our Lord. We behold the Lamb of glory, who is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. And we also are with our Christ and we behold the face of God, as our confession says. And behold the face of God in light and in glory, waiting for the full redemption of their bodies and we can go speak of further of, of different blessings we have in this time we are free from the outer man we are free from pain and suffering pain and sorrow we have complete sanctification as we see the connections with the confession london baptist confession 9 5 speaking of free will talks about this will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to do good 
alone in the state of glory only. So we have complete sanctification and we've arrived in heaven as we await the final resurrection. That's the hope of believers. That's the comfort that we have. But there's also the the sober reality of the souls of the wicked. Where do they go in the intermediate state? Well, they are cast into hell, as the confession says. And the souls of the wicked are cast into hell. I think we see this specifically in Luke 16, 23, and 24. Now, that's a, I think that's a good passage to go to with respect to the idea of hell. But the primary purpose in Luke 16 is to teach that whether someone is raised from the dead or not, whether someone sees miracles or not, they don't need someone to be raised from the dead, but they have the law and the prophets to teach them concerning Jesus Christ. It's in the context of these Pharisees who taught and were lovers of money, thinking that they could save themselves, thinking that they could enter into the kingdom by force through their works, but that's not the case because they have the law and the prophets. Isn't that what the rich man says? You know, go to my loved ones. Go to my brothers. But he says they have the law and the prophets. That's the main thrust and focus, but I think we get a glimpse into what torment looks like in Luke 16, 23, and 24. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abram far off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. So cast into hell and even here they are cast into torment in utter darkness, awaiting the day of the resurrection. Excuse me, we also see that in Jude 6 and 7 as well. In Jude 6 and 7, he describes these angels, these wicked angels who have fallen. He says, the Jude says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in, reserved in everlasting chains and under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So there is in the intermediate state, the souls of the, uh, of the elect of God's people, of believers, go to be with Christ. But the souls of the wicked are cast into hell in outer darkness. Now we need to think of an alternative view that pops its ugly head, unfortunately, in evangelical circles. And that's really the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Mm-hmm. Now purgatory is exactly how it sounds. Perhaps you'd call it purgatory. What that means is that there are certain punishments. There are certain temporal punishments that, the, that people are paying off in purgatory with respect to what are called venial sins. Last time we talked about perseverance of the saints and we talked about how Roman Catholics teach that you can lose salvation. Well, you lose salvation through committing a mortal sin, deliberate, with knowledge, and thus bringing yourself out of the state of grace and thus under and without salvation. But there are some who commit venial sins. They may not bring you out of the state of grace, but nonetheless, you still wound your conscience. You still come under temporal punishment. And purgatory is meant to purge those sins things. Sin still needs to be atoned for and purged. And one of the ways, perhaps if they're still living, that they deal with these sins is through penance or through the Eucharist, through the, uh, through the sacrament of, of the bread and the wine being transformed to the body of Christ. You see, whenever a Roman Catholic lifts, when a priest lifts up the body of and the lefts up the bread and the wine, thinking that it's actually the body and blood of Christ, they actually teach that it's a propitiatory sacrifice, that it turns away the wrath of God. That's why the Roman Eucharist is an abomination, because they're teaching that, saying that Christ's work is not sufficient. We need a further sacrifice. And one of the ways that people do that is to partake of that sacrifice in the Eucharist to further atone for their sins. That's why it is an abomination. So they do it through remission, they do it through penance. But loved ones, for those that have died and go to purgatory, can purchase what are called indulgences for those saints in purgatory, to perhaps lessen their time in purgatory. 
And there is no place of purgatory. It is unscriptural. Our confession says, besides these two places, that is, paradise and hell, for souls separated from their bodies, the scripture acknowledgeth none. It's a false doctrine. It's a wicked doctrine. And it is connected with their view of justification, doesn't it? A final justification, in some sense, where your works are part of your final justification. Thus, in some sense, you need to purge those gifts or those <clears throat> wicked acts all the more to perhaps somewhat be right with God. It's terrible and wicked and sadly, for some reason, finds its way into evangelical circles. But as we think about the intermediate state, I think we must ponder the reality of death. Death truly is inevitable, bro- inevitable brothers and sisters. And it is not natural. It is a consequence of sin. The world teaches that it's just a natural process of life. Certainly does happen to everyone, but that doesn't mean it's not that doesn't mean it's natural. It comes from sin. It's a consequence of sin. The wages of sin is death. And we think about the reality of death. There's a very different perhaps thinking about it with respect for a a believer, or, well, uh, 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 a different reality for a believer and an unbeliever. For uh, for a believer, or for an unbeliever, it shows the seriousness of sin and the just punishment that sin truly does deserve. In a lot of ways, death is, for an unbeliever, a type of final judgment. When we think about death, when we think about what it is, and I think... Ecclesiastes 12 paints a very vivid picture for us of what death looks like. Just some terrifying imagery with what it looks like. The writer in in Ecclesiastes 12, as we go back there, he says in 12.2, The sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house Tremble. Fear and trembling in that final day. And the strong men bow down. You see, death is the great leveler, isn't it? And that's what the writer to Ecclesiastes highlights. You see, when he talks about the strong men bowing down, he's talking about that all are then leveled. And then notice the grinders cease because they are few. Because you see, when you think about death, when someone dies, the reality is... Life ends. And for them, it is a final judgment. All these things cease. They're all bowing down. He goes on to say, those that look through the windows grow dim. Perhaps a wife looking out the window to see their husband return from war, but they're looking in vain. When the doors are shut in the streets and the grinding is low because the grinding ceases, the workers stop. That's what death really is like. And it paints a very terrifying and scary picture of what death looks like. For even for specifically for the unbeliever. When one rises up at the sound of a burr and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also they are afraid of the height and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden. Perhaps there's language of carrying the idea of growing old. Perhaps the idea of being lazy and a sluggard. And then the des- uh, and desire fails. The man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Death is terrifying. And that's what the vivid imagery the writer paints for us. But the reality is for believers, it's the manifestation of God's mercy to his people. It's the sure reality that because of what Christ has done, we pass through death to eternal life. We may face death. We may go through death. But because Christ has defeated death, you and I can uh, go to death with hope in the midst of death. As... Wilhelmus Abrackel says, again, I've really liked Abrackel. He has a lot of good practical things. He says, this translation from time to eternity, from this sinful life to perfect holiness, from sorrow to joy, and from strife to the crown, takes place by way of the dark valley of the king of terrors, which is death. But all those things, time to eternity, sinful life to perfect holiness, sorrow to joy, strife to to the crown. So for us, we pass from sorrow and death to happiness for the believer. It's a different reality as we think about death for the believer and the unbeliever. That's the intermediate state. 
That is before Christ our Lord turns. Let's think then, secondly, at the resurrection from the dead. What happens at the resurrection? What happens when our Lord returns? In paragraph 2, the confession says, At the last day. It is at this final time when Christ returns that those who are saved will be resurrected from the dead. And the blessing is we will all be resurrected together. There's no order when it comes to the resurrection. We'll all be raised together and be glorified together and have glorified bodies together, going to the final judgment with glorified bodies. And notice the confession talks about those who are alive at the time of Christ's coming and those who are dead. It says, such of the saints as are found alive shall not sleep, but be changed. We do not die, but have our bodies changed. We see this in several places, but 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5 are both go-to passages with respect to the resurrection. A lot of good stuff there. But 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the, twink, uh, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And then also in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, again, 1 Th- Thessalonians has a lot of end times things going on in it. 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall be always, always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. You see, uh, those who are alive when Christ returns will be caught up with our Lord. Their bodies change to resemble our Lord. It's not some secret rapture, but it's one that's visible and clear. Christ returns and we will be raptured, uh, caught up, if you will, with our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what happens to those who are living when Christ returns. But notice the dead saints. And all the dead shall be raised up with self-same bodies. You see, resurrection itself implies the self-same body, doesn't it? For it was a new body, wouldn't that be a type of new creation, a new body? You see, they go on to say, the dead shall be raised with the self-same bodies and none other. There were some, again, at the time of the confession, who taught that people didn't, weren't raised with the self-same bodies, but they had another body, perhaps made of air, and, or even some more subtlety, that, some, something more subtle than air, but definitely not flesh and blood. Air, I don't even know what that looks like or anything like that. But it comes from their view of matter. That is, we talk about, we've talked about the idea in our Sunday night uh, uh, series in 1 John, those false teachers who taught that the spirit was good and matter was bad. That has a great impact on how we view the resurrection, doesn't it? So that, that's how they view the resurrection. If matter is bad, then why would our bodies be raised? But unless God created man, body and soul, and declared that it was good. And so thus we see that with the resurrection. We see that our bodies are raised. The self-same bodies. But notice our, our confession goes on to say, although with different qualities, which shall be united again to their souls forever. You see, our eternal state, when we get, we'll talk about it in a second, but our eternal state is not one of disembodiment. It's a reunion of body and soul. It's kind of a popular position, isn't it, to have the idea of living eternally, of separated from your body, you just become this spirit that kind of wanders around. It's kind of odd to become omnipresent. That's not true. We don't become God. I don't know. I don't think we can fly. That doesn't happen either. I don't think we can go through walls because we are raised with a body like our Lord's. It's not one of disembodiment. And the best place for this is 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5 is actually a good place to go to that distinguishes between the time of the resurrection in verses 1 through 5 and the time of the intermediate state in verses 6 through 8. Verses 6 through 8 speak of the intermediate state. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. 
For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But then in verses, uh, but in verses 1 to 5, he says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He's speaking of resurrection here. The idea of house is referring to a body. We have a house not made with hands, that eternal house, one that resembles our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, based on what Christ has done, on Christ's resurrection. We also see this in, again in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 41 and 42. Sorry, 42 and 43. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, became a life being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. And so you see the basis for the resurrection is found in our Lord. Because Christ has been raised from the dead, you and I have certainty that we will be raised from the dead with a body like our Lord's. That will be conformed to Christ's body. So as we thought about the eternal state, we pondered death, but here we can ponder Christ's resurrection as a comfort for us. Christ is the one who defeated death. Christ did not see corruption in the grave. Christ is the one who lived, died, lived, died, and rose again on behalf of his people, that we might have hope in the midst of the reality of death. And as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, it is a comfort for believers. When we face the sorrows and trials of this life, we have the reality of death that awaits us. We can pass through that knowing that we will be raised again. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Because of Christ who died and defeated death. Based on our Lord, based on what he has done, we can have comfort because of Christ's resurrection, knowing that you and I will be resurrected like our Lord's. So that's the resurrection. What happens at the resurrection? Let's look lastly then at the eternal state. What happens for eternity? Now, even as we use these words, eternity, what does that even really mean? We kind of gloss over these terms sometimes without thinking of them sometimes, even as we think about hell and what that looks like and what eternal life looks like. I don't think we understand most of the time the weight of what those things actually mean. We just don't until perhaps that time. But in the eternal state, we speak of, um, the confession speaks of what the unjust shall go through and the just. Notice the bodies of the unjust shall, by the power of Christ, be raised to dishonor. You see, there is a resurrection in general. The dead will be raised too. And as this is what what the writers say in Acts 24, 15. This is what Paul says in Acts 24, 15. He says, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accepted, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. And we get further clarification in John 28, 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So the unjust will be raised to dishonor in a general resurrection, but the just, the just shall be raised to honor. Now, even as we think about this reality of, the, of dishonor, the unjust to dishonor, the Bible doesn't teach annihilationism. It doesn't teach that our body and soul will be destroyed at the final judgment. It doesn't teach that. What it teaches is the reality that hell, it, and, and doesn't teach that there's no hell either. I mean, hell is just one of those clear doctrines found in Scripture. It's just there. I'm very sorry. Even some of the t- brothers, or not brothers, some of the heretics at the time of, our, of, the, uh, of the confession <laughs> taught that there was no hell. And so, but there is hell. It is conscience, a conscious. We saw that in Luke 16. The rich man's aware of what's going on. 
He knows what's happening. It is conscious punishment, body and soul. Not only is it conscious, conscious it is unending. Mark 9.43 speaks of a fire that is unquenched. Think about that imagery of fire for a moment as it burns through the forest. There is no water that can put it out. There is no other fire that can put it out. I know sometimes to stop a fire, you have to get another fire going. That won't happen. It is one that burns unending. And it is endless. We see this in Matthew 25, 46. On the lips of our Lord, when he's talking about the sheep and the goats, dividing between them, he says in Matthew 25, 46, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It is endless. It is conscious. It is unending. A fire that is unquenched. And even as we think about the popular notion of hell, some think that it's the absence of God. I like the Westminster Larger Catechism 89. It's the favorable presence of God. You see, our God is omnipresent, isn't he? And the reality is that not only is he merciful and just and good, but he, or he's merciful, but he's also just, and he will bring justice towards his, uh, on those who are against him. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9. He says, in flaming, uh, he's talking about final judgment and glory in the midst of persecution. And in 7, he says, and to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Not separation, but from the favorable presence of our Lord. That is the right and proper understanding of eternal punishment. So that's the... That's the scary part. That's the terrifying part. That's for the unjust. Sober reality. But there's also the blessing of what the just will engage in as well. The bodies of the unjust, uh, sorry, the bodies of the just by his spirit unto honor and be made conformable to his own glorious body. The Westminster Larger Catechism 38 says, At the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoyment of God to all eternity. And we do that because we are conformed to Christ's body. That's what Paul says in Philippians 3.21 as we wait the time when we are conformed to Christ's body. Again, Christ goes before us. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Christ is the certainty of the resurrection because he has been raised our bodies will be raised and conformed to his body. So as we think about then this idea of having a body, a resurrected body, we must think of it too in light of final judgment. We go to the final judgment with a resurrected body, brothers and sisters. You see, as the confession says in chapter 32, he talks about that final day. And God says it is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy. In the eternal salvation of the elect. So as we go to the... You know, sometimes I think we worry when we go to the final judgment. Will there be a video of all our sins played before everyone? Will everyone see it? Will everyone know what we've done? Now, if that does happen, we'll own it and be like, we're covered in the blood of the Lamb of Christ, won't we? Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's what's going to... I don't think that's necessarily what's going on. Because you see, when we go to the judgment, we don't go to see God as the judge, but we go to see Christ as our Father, don't we? Isn't that the thrust and the focus? It's not sins revisited, but rejoicing over sins forgiven. That's the thrust and the point. We'll have to give an account, but we say we are covered in the blood of Christ our Lord, and we've been conformed to His body. And even as we think about the order of that final day, it is resurrection first, then final judgment. So take hope, take courage, knowing that you go to that final day with uh, with that resurrected body. 
And the blessedness of that time is that we see our Lord. We see Him. We have that immediate vision and from fruition of God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit for all eternity. It is perfect and full communion. As Scripture says, we have physical and visible sight of God on that last day. We primarily see God manifesting His glory through Christ. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We're going back there again. 2 Corinthians 5 and, and 1 Corinthians 15 are excellent passages. But 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And even in 1 John 2, 28. Speaking of how we will see our Lord as He is. But notice it's seeing our Lord. And now little children, abide in Him. That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. When he appears, we have confidence to not be ashamed. We will see our Lord as he is. Now the blessedness of eternity, as we've talked about briefly, is the reality that we have dwelling with God, isn't it? When we think about the garden, that really was a temple, brothers and sisters. The place where God dwelt with his people. Adam really was the first priest. I think one writer, his name is G.K. Beale, defends this very, very well. The garden is the place where we dwell with God. (coughs) Adam sins, and thus what's lost? Communion with God in a special sense. And then we see the temple. We see glimpses of what dwelling with God looks like. You realize Exodus, the, the blessed part of Exodus, the culmination, the climax, is not the Exodus it's Exodus 40, when the, when the cloud comes upon the tabernacle, that God dwells with his people as a type that points forward to Christ our Lord, as a type that points forward to that final new heavens and new earth. As you trace through the temple, throughout the scriptures, we see it in the garden. We see it with uh, the, the, the temple at Sinai. We see it with Christ our Lord. And we also see it at the new heavens and the new earth. Because we will be dwelling with the God of heaven and earth. As a brackle says, Oh, how sweet it shall be to sit eternally under the shadow of the almighty good, loving, all-sufficient, and benevolent God. As the hymn writer says, Not at the crown he gifteth, but on his pierced hand, the Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. As we thought about these other points, intermediate state, we pondered death. As we thought about resurrection, we pondered Christ's work. As we think about the eternal state, we must ponder reality. The reality of the eternal state. Eternal reality. It is a terror to the ungodly. A brackle paints a vivid picture for us. Both for the terror to the ungodly and the comfort to the godly. He says... For the terror to the ungodly. Those eyes which you now misuse so greatly to stir up filthy lust, whereby you now display the wrath, pride, and vanity of the heart, will behold with terror the Lord Jesus, the righteous judge, and will never see light any more. Then he talks about the ears. Then he speaks of the mouth, and he says, That mouth and tongue which you now misuse to curse, lie, backbite, say vain things, indulge, uh, 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 drink, and fornicate, will then howl and scream, and in grief you will chew on that tongue. Yes, all those members which you are now using as weapons of unrighteousness to serve the world and sin will eternally be in flames. He's he's painting a vivid picture with the senses, isn't he there? Petrifying, brothers and sisters. It's a terror to the godly. And as we think about this reality, should not stir in us the, uh, to, uh, an urgency to share the gospel more with people when we think about what this actually is? I must confess I'm not very good at it, but it, as we think about these things, it should stir up in us to teach and share the gospel with people. Mm-hmm. Terrifying reality. Mm-hmm. But there's a comfort for the godly with respect to eternity, isn't there? And he says, as he speaks of the comfort to the godly, he says, Believer, be it known, however... That your bodies, in which you now must suffer so much, will one day be delivered from all sorrows. The Lord will then wipe away all tears from your eyes, and will change this vile body, so that it may be conformed to the glorious body of Christ. 
Your eyes will rejoice in beholding your beloved Jesus and all those glorious things which are to be seen in heaven. Your ears will delight themselves in hearing the heavenly hallelujahs, and you will join them in singing the heavenly doxologies. All that God has prepared to the delight of your body, the Lord will cause you to enjoy forever. What wondrous exchange that will be! Therefore, in all patience, suffer all that is distasteful to the body, and counteract your suffering by the expectation of glory. That's what awaits us, brothers and sisters, Mm -hmm. because of our Lord. I mean, even as we sometimes, perhaps when you're singing, as we stop to hear other people sing, it perhaps gives us glimpses, perhaps, to what that will be like. Perhaps sometimes you see Pastor Butler, he'll stop at the last stanza before he preaches, doesn't he? I've gotten the habit of doing that too. When I stop and listen to the other brothers and sisters, I get this glimpse of what that will be like. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And that's what we look forward to, that golden shore, that place we go to because of our Lord and Savior. There's no more sin, no more sorrow, no more pain. What a wondrous exchange that will be. So in conclusion then, as we come to the close of this study of salvation, we are saved by, God's, by Christ's work, which is applied by the Holy Spirit to us. We are saved by effectual calling. We are saved by God's gifts of faith and repentance, justification, adoption, sanctification, perseverance, and as we look forward to glorification, as well, culminating in a glorified body and eternal happiness with the Lord of heaven and earth. Believers, this should give us comfort. This should give us hope. And this should give us cause to press on in the fight. Press on in the faith. Press on as we wait that eternal glory. And even as we think for the other side, for unbelievers, this, as we think about eternal punishment and and hell and all those types of things that's the reality of unbelievers without the savior isn't it a place of terrifying reality (coughs) that we don't think we think through often and both of these things i don't think we think through often and i I don't think we'll ever fathom truly what that actually looks like but as we think about that reality believer uh, we must preach the truth that unbelievers might come to saving knowledge in Christ. And if you are not a believer, believe on the Lord, and you shall be raised with Christ at that final day. You shall have everlasting life. And that's why we call you to, pray, to, to believe the gospel. We don't do it because we hate you. We do it because we do love you. Believe on Christ, and you shall be saved. Thankfully, we have a blessed Lord who is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. Well, let us go to our God in prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great work. Who is man that you are mindful of him, O God? Who is man that you would send forth your Son in love to save his people from their sins? We thank you for many of us here today, O God. You have saved us. You've worked in us. You've called us out of darkness to believe on the Lord. O God, that you even are mindful of us. Thank you for this gift. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. And Father God, we pray that we would continue to preach your gospel. We know that you know who are yours. And we know that you call forth your people through the preaching of the gospel. And may these difficult doctrines, may these true doctrines, these real doctrines, even of hell, may these cause people to consider the, the, the weightiness of sin. May it cause sinners to look to Christ, to believe on him, to find but hope in him, the one who was raised from the dead, that they might have everlasting life, that they might have everlasting happiness with the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for all that you are. And we pray that you would be glorified now in the name of Christ. Amen.